Welcome. This is a production brought to you by the Idaho Commission on Aging. This presentation is part of the Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Program and is facilitated by Aaron Olson. Also presented in partnership with the following. 321, our official good morning and welcome to fall. Uh, we, we don't want to fall this fall or anytime. So we are providing these seminars uh, in order to teach people what they need to know to help prevent falls. This is one of actually a, a series of four seminars. Three of them are for consumers. We have already done uh, trip hazards at home, how to uh, find and reduce those, as well as one called Simple Steps, which is about exercises that you can do at home. Today, we're going to cover some other topics that I shall talk about more in just a moment. But I wanted to start by welcoming everybody, thanking you for taking the time in your busy, busy, busy schedule to be with us. And we hope that you enjoy the information we're about to share. Next slide. I, I think I may have enabled your sharing. So we do always need to, uh, you know, do a, a little bit of um, of uh, appreciation for why we are here and, and doing what we do. I work with the Idaho Commission on Aging. I am the program specialist that manages, among other things, the Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Program, which is really where, where falls prevention comes into play. Falls has become a passion of mine, so we are going to be doing a lot more of it, actually starting uh, right now. We are in the process of developing the first uh, Falls Prevention Coalition of Idaho, and that way we will be able to provide education like this uh, year round instead of just in September. Do have to talk a little bit though about the Administration for Community Living or HCL. They are the ones that provide our federal funding for the programs that we can offer. Uh, they also have the National Commission on Aging or NCOA. And together they actually observe Falls Prevention Awareness Week. But you know, they say things are always bigger and better in Texas? Well, I don't think so, because in Idaho, we do Falls Prevention Awareness Month and have been for a couple of years now. So uh, we just want to uh, thank them for providing the funding, letting you know where that comes from, and that we will be uh, expanding our provision of these seminars in the near future. Next slide, please. So of course we have to do a little bit of logistics. The first is if you have questions, please use the Q&A panel. There is a, a Q&A uh, for this seminar. There is also a chat box, but the Q&A for questions specifically makes it easier. So go ahead and put your questions in there as we're working so you don't have to try to remember them until the end. But at the end, we will hopefully have time for our panelists to uh, go through any questions that you may have about the topics that we have covered today. Next slide, please. We do have seminar materials. I know that in every seminar, webinar, online meeting, or whatever else you wanna say, the question always comes up at least 20 times. Can we have a copy of the slides? The answer is yes, you can. Uh, probably by this afternoon, they will be available on our website. And you'll hear me say this URL a few times. It's http colon forward slash forward slash aging.idaho.gov forward slash falls, F A L L S. That is going to be your landing page for everything falls related. On the right hand side of the screen when you log on, there are two things. Uh, on the left column, there is our entire reference library, but on the right is our seminar 2022 materials. So you will find a copy of the slide deck, also uh, our bios for our panelists that are appearing today, and the recording when that is ready as well. Next slide, please. So nobody likes to talk about when bad things happen. 
But what I know is that if you plan ahead, then those bad things aren't really as devastating as they could be. So this is our technical emergency plan for the day. If you get cut off, please just rejoin us as soon as possible. This will be recorded. You will get a copy of the slides. So if you miss something for a minute or two, you will be able to pick up on that using either of those resources. If we lose a panelist, that would be awful. But you know, I, I can fill time. <laughs> so if that happens, uh, I will take over um, either for just a moment with some chatter or their presentation until they are able to rejoin us. If we lose what I like to call the mothership, which is, of course, the Zoom platform or ICOA as a whole, um, and in this case, we have uh, Barbara and Chris up in North Idaho, that's a little more serious, but we have backups. Uh, that's why I'm here and they are there, so there will be things that we can do if that happens. The one that we can't do a whole heck of a lot about is, you know, the huge... Uh, uh, solar flares or other things that can disrupt things. If we have that kind of a technical issue, we will contact you when we are ready to reschedule the seminar so we have a second chance at it. Let's all hope that none of that happens, but at least now we are prepared if it does. Next slide, please, Barbara. As I said, we do record the seminar, but there are those legal things that say you have to tell people that they're being recorded. So this is just a reminder that you are being recorded. However, for the most part, none of you will be seen or heard on this seminar. So usually it's not an issue with privacy or anything like that. The recording will become available first via the Zoom platform. Zoom will send you an email telling you probably half within half an hour after we're done that it is ready and you are able to view it there. That is going to be, of course, the raw recording with uh, everything in it that was said uh, as is. A little bit later after that, we will put in a, a little more polished presentation of that, cutting out any technical issues and, and things like that. So we will send you an email or it will also be available from that uh, aging.idaho.gov forward slash falls website. Next slide, please. So that brings us down to what we are going to discuss so that you can learn how not to fall today, our agenda, if you will. I'm going to start off with a little brief section on understanding falls, just so we all have kind of a good foundation and know where we're starting. Then our first panelist, Dr. Bates, is going to talk to us about some of the phys physical outcomes of falls. He will be followed by Dr. Kinahan, who's going to talk about medications and falls. And finally, we will have Caitlin Gaines, who is going to discuss, uh, try to discuss in her short time, all of the things, all of the things that physically can be uh, related to falls. And that, that also is, is a huge topic. Then of course, we will finish with our Q&A time permitting. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I always like to say, are you ready? Then let's just get to it. Next slide, please. As I said, I'm gonna start off by giving you a brief understanding of falls. So if we go to the next slide, please. I think it's important for us to actually define what is a fall. And people kind of probably roll their eyes and go, well, what do you mean? Everybody knows what that word means. Even a toddler knows what that word means. Yeah, we kind of do. But if I will asked you about a definition, I'd probably get 20 different answers. And none of them would necessarily be wrong. They just may not be complete. So for our purposes, when we are talking about a fall, it, uh, it has this definition. And, you know, they're, it, it's worded the way it is for a reason. We know that in order to have a fall, that we're going to consider a fall, it's going to be something that really is uncontrolled. We don't plan it. We don't control it. A fall just happens. It is spontaneous. Otherwise, it, it's not considered a fall. Um, and it's uncontrolled. Uh, we do try to control our body as we are falling. But really, we, we don't have the ability to stop it. 
because if we do, then it's not going to be a fall. The second thing that's important is that our body moves from a higher to a lower plane. Well, what the heck does that mean? That means that if I'm standing and I fall to the floor, then I have gone from a higher plane standing to a lower plane, the floor. But it does not mean we always have to fall to the floor. We can stumble and fall into a couch or a table and hopefully be able to put our hands out and stop the fall at that point. But still, because it was uncontrolled, unplanned, and we went from standing to having our hands on the table, um, then, then that is considered a fall. So I think that is a really, really important part of this definition as well. We can fall into a couch, we can fall into a table, we can even fall into a fall, uh, or fall into a wall, rather fall into a fall, fall into a wall. If you ever think about stumbling and you put your hands out and you stop because there's a wall in front of you, you are still at a slightly lower plane than you were when you were completely standing up. So keep this definition in mind. It really is a good one and it really is important when we're communicating with others about falls, especially older adults. No one likes to admit that they're falling. Older adults especially don't like to admit they're falling because usually they think it's going to take away their independence. People are gonna start worrying about them. They're gonna stop letting them do the activities they enjoy. And so half of older adults do not ever report a fall to their family or their doctor, even if they had injuries associated with it. That's why when we communicate about falls, it's important to say it's not about blame. It's not about bad or good. We just need to know what's going on so we can address the causes and reduce their risk. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a, a summary slide at the beginning because we know that there are a bunch of different things that we can talk about when it comes to falls. And sometimes it's hard to, to focus. We, we hear interesting things, but what is it that is, is really, really, really important? So as our panelists present to you today, uh, we will learn that um, falling does increase as we age. One in three older adults in Idaho falls, which is actually higher than the US average, which is one in four. Uh, so we have a, a bigger problem with older adult falls than the rest of the nation. And what also important about this is just because falls do increase as we age does not mean that they have to. Falls are not a normal part of aging. So if somebody ever tries to tell you, oh, I'm falling, but that's just what happens to older people. No, it's what happens to older people who don't do the second and third parts of the slide and the rest of our discussion today. So the second part is that there are factors that impact our falls risk. And this is just a very you know, cursory list. There are a lot of factors and uh, those again are available in, in depth on our website. But you know, the fact that we become inactive as we age means that we lose muscle strength, flexibility and balance which increases our risk of falls. So that's an example of some of the things that we actually have control over, moving you know, kind of to the, the third column over here. What can we do about falls? Well, we can do all of the things we're gonna talk about today to make ourselves stronger and more flexible. And that doesn't mean becoming you know, a, a gym rat or a, a bodybuilder. Some simple things that you can do at home, it means knowing about your medications and how they impact your falls risk and how to talk to your doctor and your pharmacist about medications. And it also means being sure that you are eating and drinking appropriately. So these are just a few of the things to keep in mind, kind of the big overriding categories that we have as we talk more in depth about some of the things that we can uh, know to understand why falls happen. Next slide, please. Another thing that you will find, hopefully by the end of today, is that falls are multifaceted. It's not one thing, it's usually a combination of things that, that brings a fall. Falls impact people not only 
from their physical standpoint with injuries, but also their psychological um, standing sometimes, their social sociability, and of course, financially. Falls are extremely expensive. But all of those fit into this fall cycle, which is that unfortunately, once a person falls, they are twice as likely to fall again. And then they get into this falls cycle unless somebody does something themselves, their caregivers, their family members, their healthcare providers to get them out of the cycle. If any of you know of an older person who has fallen, you probably know that once they have fallen, then they have a heightened fear of falling. Um, whatever it was before, it's probably higher now. When you get a higher fear, higher fear of falling, then you probably reduce your activity. Well, I'm not gonna get up onto that stepladder because I might fall. I'm not gonna go work in my garden because I might fall. So once you get reduced activity, then we move down into the cycle. And that of course is muscle weakness. If I'm not using my muscles, they're going to get weaker. And we can see how that brings us back over to the other side of the fall cycle and our risk of falling increases. So no matter where somebody joins the cycle, it unfortunately happens this way unless there's an intervention. And we're going to provide some of the interventions so you never get into the cycle to begin with. Next slide, please. All righty. What all of this comes down to is that avoiding falls is the best thing we can do. It's kind of like other things we talk about. You know, can I fix my car because it's insured if I get into a wreck? Well, yes, but it's best to avoid the wreck to begin with, right? So we're going to do the same thing with falls by learning like you are today what a fall is, what the risk factors are, and what you can do to intervene, that's going to help you avoid them and hopefully remain falls free. Next slide, please. So it is my pleasure to introduce now to you, Dr. Rodney Bates. I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, three years ago. He was one of our first panelists on our seminars. He works with the Idaho, um, Idaho College of Osteopathic Medicine, or ICOM, where he is faculty, overseer, manager, mentor, and everything else you can think of. He has a great past uh, in internal medicine and as a hospitalist. And he is going to give us a, a little bit of information about the, uh, really the, the outcomes from falls. What are they? What do they really do to us? Which will tell us why we should care. Dr. Bates, are you with us? I am, and thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it, and so good to be with all of you. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. Take it away. Wonderful. Yeah, so happy to be with all of you. I am a uh, long-term native of Idaho, actually born and raised in southern Idaho in a very small town, so you can read that on my bio with the information, but so happy to be with you. Next slide. So I get the uh, unfortunate outcome, I guess, uh, to uh, discuss physical outcomes. And, uh, you know, even though this is maybe a motivator from a negative input, um, it's important to realize what happens to us when we do fall as we age. So I want to start start by sharing a little story, you know, many of us, you know, we, we may do things that uh, our brains say, hey, you're not as old as you think you are, you can still do this. When in reality, our bodies are not ready for that. And for example, I, I want to share a personal story of my grandfather, who was a uh, southern Idaho farmer, long term farmer, and uh, was very, very active, of course, wore his joints out. So he had to go in to receive a new knee, uh, knee replacement for severe arthritis of the knee. And uh, shortly after, probably within two weeks of receiving that knee, he decided he was going to go out and do things he had normally done very actively in uh, his farming with irrigation and decided, hey, I'm going to jump this ditch to uh, uh, start working in this field. And uh, 
he you know didn't realize that his knee wasn't ready for that and ended up uh, completely destroying his new knee so he ended up with about three or four replacements of that knee as you can imagine so so we have to listen to our bodies next uh, slide But I uh, really want to focus on the physical impact other, other than just knee replacements, but what are some of the other outcomes and impact to our bodies so physically from falls? Next slide. <clears throat> so as Aaron pointed out, you know, there are some environmental, situational, and of course, with our own thought process of how we deal with falls, but there, there are some risks. So multiple factors contribute to falls. We know that surfaces, so slippery surfaces, uneven surfaces, this could be a rug that's in the middle of the floor, a loose rug. Uh, maybe you slip on that rug or you trip over it as trying to you know, shuffle across the floor. Uh, many uh, elderly uh, people will have a difficult time lifting their feet, especially if they've, they're in that fall cycle with decreased weakness and, or sorry, with increased weakness and disability of picking up the feet. And so tripping over hazards, those can be electrical cords, uh, maybe tables in the middle of the floor, pets. I can't tell you how many times I've seen patients that have had a trip or a pet that runs underneath their feet and they end up on the floor with a, with a hip fracture. Next slide. So once that fall has happened, you know, what else can also affect our ability to maintain an upright posture where, the, well, there's many risk factors, so visual inputs, you know, if we don't see appropriately, you know, maybe we don't see that cord or we don't see that uh, jumbled up uh, carpet on the floor and, and uh, we don't see that uh, barrier into the next room that causes us to trip. There may be central nervous system issues, so where our nervous system does not communicate appropriately with our limbs. And so our feet may not communicate or in timely communication with our brain. So we're already falling before we uh, you know, cross that threshold and can stop ourselves from falling appropriately. Inner ear issues, you know, causing dizziness or lightheadedness or inability to maintain that upright posture. Uh, something called neuropathy, and this can be associated with diabetes. This really is numbness or decreased sensation, uh, specifically of the lower extremities, but can also affect the hands or other areas of the body. Uh, that can be another input to our brain saying, okay, I don't know where I'm at in space. And so I may take off to go walking across the room or try to step over something and don't realize where my foot is. And down we go. Musculoskeletal, this really refers to the strength. So sarcopenia just means uh, decreased muscle strength or decreased ability of our muscles to maintain our functional, functional status. Poor posture, joint deformities, obvious issues that can affect our ability to maintain an, a good, stable, upright posture. Next paragraph, or sorry, next uh, slide. So what are some of the actual issues that we can deal with? Well, skin damage for one is on the surface. Biggest organ in the body is our skin. Have bruising, tears, breakdown, bed sores can, can occur if we have decreased ability to get up and around and risk of infection. Next slide. What about battered bones? So what, what happens to our bones? This is one of the more obvious effects of falls. And uh, in this individual, after having a fall, uh, suffered a left hip fracture. Um, that's a very common fracture that we see in the aging population and can cause significant disability and increased risk of death later on as well and disability and really institutes that fall cycle that was spoken of. This can also occur with fractures of the spine, other extremities, you know, outreaching to try to catch yourself. They have a, a wrist, ankle, or, or upper arm fracture. Ribs, uh, horrible pain associated with rib fractures and can cause disability in and of themselves. Next slide. So 
So what about uh, head injuries? Yes, uh, uh, obvious issues. And as we age, the vessels in our brain and surrounding the brain become quite brittle and uh, even falling and maybe not even hitting the head, but just that initial jolt can cause bleeds to occur in the brain, especially if you are taking any blood thinners or other uh, medications that may increase your risk of bleeding. And so that can be a huge issue, uh, let alone concussions and uh, other types of brain injuries that may cause significant disability and decrease mobility in and of themselves. Next slide. So other common outcomes that uh, commonly we don't think about, but are very common would be pain. Of course, just the pain and the loss of function associated with pain. You know, it's, if we have pain, we decrease our, our activities just for whatever reason to avoid further pain and uh, definitely will increase risk of future falls. So a uh, common cause of fall risk, just diminishing our, our ability to continue forward. Next slide. So what about uh, after hospitalization? Let's say someone uh, fractures their hip or has other significant disability associated with the fall. What happens after say a patient goes into the hospital? Um, well, there is data on this and half of persons who were hospitalized will require some degree of placement outside of the home. So only one in three can go home without assistance, but, uh, and only 6% go home with, e with even with some assistance, <clears throat> uh, up to 5% or more needed a rehab facility of, and half were eventually readmitted to the hospital. So you can see that this causes significant disability, significant requirements, and can lead to loss of independence in the home. Now, obvious uh, risk of death one year after a significant injury, such as a hip fracture, we know that that includes a high degree of what we call morbidity and mortality. Uh, but one in three he may, may have died within a year after that initial injury. Next slide. And I don't wanna to get too caught up in the data but there is other data and outcomes uh, such as uh, death rates. So increased 30% and from 2007 to 2016 for most older adults, we can see that trend continues. Uh, a lot of this has to do with an aging population, but death rates per 100,000, you can see that continues to rise uh, and can be directly correlative to falls and the increased disability that occurs after a fall. So by 2030, it's estimated that we may see up to seven deaths uh, per hour associated with falls. Next slide. And I know these things can be quite overwhelming, but just wanted to give you a glimpse into some of the risks associated with falls uh, from a physical standpoint. And now I will turn the time over to Dr. Kinahan. Well, thank you, Dr. Bates, and you did a fantastic job. Uh, only a little bit of clearing your voice, so I hope that's a, a good indication. With that, I'm going to thank him for you know all the fascinating insights about the unfortunate things that happen because of falls, and we don't usually think about them. That's it. It's like, oh, somebody fell. They they scraped their knee. Um, we know with older people that hip fractures, over 93% of hip fractures are from falls, and a huge majority of those end up in hospitals and in long-term care. So understanding really what the impact is can sometimes make us a little more aware of wanting to prevent them. But with that, I am going to introduce you to Dr. Kinahan, who is going to speak to us about medications. She actually uh, has her final educational history, that was, that was not the way I wanted to say it, but <laughs> through University of Washington, uh, but she's been in Boise for several years. She worked for quite a while with St. Alphonse's in many of their clinics. Uh, her specialty is geriatrics. She also was uh, kind of important in getting the St. Alphonse's Falls Clinic 
uh, underway. She did just recently, however, move over to the Boise VA Medical Center, giving some awesome care to our veterans to meet their needs. She is the medical director for the Community Living Center. She also works with some of their memory care programs. And if that wasn't enough, she also is uh, working with University of Washington residents who are doing the residence, uh, residence, residency work at the VA Medical Center. So without further ado, let me introduce to you, Dr. Caitlin Kinahan. Thank you. Um, so I am gonna talk about the role of medications um, as a geriatrician. One of my areas of particular interest is medication safety and safe prescribing in older adults, and particularly uh, the way in which medications can affect fall risk and um, how we can use safe prescribing and use safe medications to reduce the risk of falling. Next slide, please. So all medications are a balancing act. We have to think about um, the fact that patients need medications, right? Um, any medication you take hopefully is because you are needing it. Um, however, every medication has side effects and sometimes we're willing to put up with those side effects um, because we understand that the medication is needed. And other times those side effects cause things like falls or confusion. And that's when we have to really take a critical look um, at whether that medication is doing more harm than good. When I say medication, I think patients and families usually think about prescriptions kind of right out of the gate. Um, they think about things that a doctor has told them um, to take, but it's important to also consider over-the-counter medications, um, particularly things like antihistamines, sleeping pills, and I'll talk about those in more detail. And then not to forget things like vitamins, eye drops, and any dietary supplements, because all of those really do pile up and the additive effect is um, also a concern. Next slide, please. So polypharmacy is this concept of, the more, me of more medications and polypharmacy is defined as greater than six medications um, per patient per day of patients um, using Medicare, so Medicare beneficiaries, greater than half will be taking more than six medications. And that includes supplements, vitamins, over-the-counters, like I just described. Um, the more medications someone is taking, the more likely they are to fall. Um, and then beyond that, specific drug types do increase the risk of falling. The most common ones that I see as a geriatrician that are associated with falls, particularly in patients that I meet in the hospital or in the nursing home where I work, are patients who have had a fall who are taking things like benzodiazepines and other sedatives, um, as well as antidepressants, antipsychotic drugs, and then less commonly cardiac medications and then diabetes medications. The other thing to be aware of is that anytime a medication dose is adjusted, people are at this transient increased risk of falling. And that seems to be related to either um, the fact that something is new and so there's increased risk of error um, or just as your body is getting used to those changes. Next slide, please. So when talking to your doctor, I'm sorry, the image got a little crowded here, but when talking to your doctor, Anytime there's a new medication being prescribed, the questions to think about are, what do I need to know about this medication? Are there any side effects that I should expect? And what do I do if I have a problem? Do I call 911? Do I go to the emergency room? Do I stop taking the medication? Is that a safe thing to do? Is that going to cause me more harm if I abruptly stop the medication? So kind of getting that guidance in advance, if there's gonna be any kind of problem with this medication, what do I need to know in advance? Next slide, please. So blood pressure uh, medications are the ones that can cause that dizziness, low blood pressure, dehydration, just like Dr. Bates was talking about. Um, they can also affect the electrolytes or salts in your blood. Um, and all of those can cause a fall. Um, so particularly needing to be careful with diuretics or water pills. So medications like furosemide, also called Lasix, bumetanide, which is called Bumex, or hydrochlorothiazide. 
And then any medication that is used to improve urination in men with um, large prostates, particularly such as Tansulosin or Flomax or Terazosin. I use generic names because I'm at the VA, um, but these all also have brand names as well. I don't know all the time. The big thing with these medications is watching for that lightheadedness when going from sitting to standing particularly and making sure that you're keeping up with your fluid needs, particularly on hot summer days like we get here in Idaho. Next slide, please. Diabetes medications do require a little bit of caution because low blood sugar has been associated with falls. In older adults especially, Low blood sugar can cause dizziness, changes in thinking and memory. Um, it can cause actually a loss of consciousness and then of course a fall, which is what we're talking about. The one that is kind of the most common culprit is insulin, um, but also medicines that end with glitazone, like pioglitazone or rosy glitazone um, have been associated with low blood sugar as well. Metformin, I generally don't worry about to the same extent. It's usually pretty safe. Um, and then the one that I didn't put on the slide, but I do worry about quite a bit in older adults is called glipizide because it can cause low blood sugar too. So same thing, making sure that if you're taking a diabetes medication, you're not skipping meals, making sure that you're watching your blood sugar carefully um, and aware of what to do if your blood sugar does go too low. Next slide. Medications that affect the brain. This is probably the most important category and it's the largest category by far. And it, this is by no means a comprehensive list. It's just meant to be kind of a guidance. Um, medications that are in the antipsychotic class that can be used as sedatives or sleeping pills. Um, and then medications that are specifically prescribed sleeping pills such as Zolpidem, which is Ambien is one of the most common ones. And then the benzodiazepine class, um, diazepam, lorazepam, clonazepam, are all very commonly associated with falls, particularly when they are used for sleep or anxiety. Um, we see a lot of patients um, get up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom, um, trip, get confused, get disoriented, and have a fall. Um, a lot of the benzodiazepine class, in particular, um, patients were put on them you know, back in the 80s or 90s, and then now patients are older, time has passed, your ability to metabolize the drug has changed. Um, and that is when I get particularly worried about those drugs. So those are kind of the ones that are particularly concerning for me as a geriatrician, because they also affect thinking and memory. The over-the-counter sleeping pills, um, are also very worrying to me. So Unisom, Tylenol PM, anything that has PM in it um, is associated with falling, typically has very similar active ingredients and same class of medications as the over-the-counter antihistamines like Benadryl or Diphenhydramine, which is the generic. Um, these medications are associated with um, urinary retention, dry mouth, confusion um, over the long term increases risk of dementia and again increases risk of falling. Um, those ones I worry about particularly because they're not being prescribed and so physicians often don't know when their patients are taking those ones. So um, it's important to make sure that your doctor knows exactly what you're taking all the time. Um, and then certain antidepressants, not all, but amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and other antidepressants in the tricyclic antidepressant class, um, and then other painkillers such as morphine and other related drugs, same thing, they cause confusion and they increase the risk of falling. Next slide, please. So pain medications um, can be, tricky. Um, a lot of pain medications can be overprescribed. Um, not every pain requires a pill, right? There are options for pain um, that does not require an opioid pain medication. Um, some opioid pain medications can be habit forming. Um, so oxycodone and hydrocodone are the ones listed, but obviously I mentioned morphine before, 
hydromorphone, fentanyl, all of those medications um, are associated with increased risk of falling in older adults. Um, the NSAID class, which is your ibuprofen, naproxen, meloxicam, and diclofenac are generally safer from a uh, risk of falling uh, point of view, but um, they do increase risk of bleeding if a fall were to occur, like Dr. Bates was referring to. Next slide. Um, this is just to remind you that um, if you are having any problems with pain medications, getting help is the next is a, a great option. Um, learning to manage chronic pain is obviously um, the next best step. And then making sure to dispose of unused or unneeded medication at a pharmacy or um, police station usually has um, take back programs. Next slide. So what you can do when a new medication is prescribed, just like we talked about, ask about side effects, ask about potential risks, at your annual visit or at any time is appropriate, talk to your doctor about reducing your total number of medications. I like my patients to sort of come to me with what are your priorities for your own health? Is your total number of pills a burden to you? Which ones are um, important to you that you keep? You know, some patients will say, I can't get through my day without this particular one. Any over-the-counter medications you take, make sure you're reading the label, you know exactly what's in it um, because they don't always say exactly um, on the front of the box what you're taking. If you're not sure, you can always ask the pharmacist. Um, it's particularly important because there are some times where you might be taking something like Tylenol PM and then you're taking Benadryl for your allergies and you're doubling up on the same active ingredient and increasing your risk of falling. And then the most important, um, in my opinion, because I work in a nursing home, um, at the time of hospitalization, um, very, very high risk for errors with medication prescribing. So double checking your medications as you're leaving the hospital, because it's a common time for um, medication errors to occur, common time for prescribing errors to happen. And um, as we know, any time that those doses are adjusted or any time new medications are started, the risk of falls goes up. Next slide. That's all for me. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kinahan. Again, uh, medications is such a huge, huge area and there's such a variation that it's hard to know which ones are going to impact falls risk and, and why. Um, I like telling personal stories, so I can tell you that uh, as a type 1 diabetic, kind of every type 1 diabetic is put onto uh, blood pressure medication to try to prevent cardiac issues uh, for the long term, but I didn't have high blood pressure, so we had to adjust that medication because every time I would stand up too fast or uh, get out of bed too fast, I would get dizzy, so perfect example of, of the kinds of things that can happen that we may or may not think about. Also wanted to, again, kind of reiterate that uh, we know there's an opiate epidemic. Uh, no matter what kind of meds you have, if you have meds in your home, you should keep them safe, just like a firearm. You have a firearm, is fine, but you should be in a gun safe. Um, we have drug safes that you can purchase online or from your pharmacy. They come in very small to very large, but they protect everybody from having access to your meds whether they're narcotics and dangerous or not. They can be good for children, to keep children away from drugs. It's never okay for them to have access, but also neighbors, friends, people who may unfortunately be going through your, your bathroom trying to, trying to find uh, drugs that they want to have instead of buying them off the street. So just buy a, a drug safe, keep all your stuff in there, then you know where it is and it's safe from everybody else. Drug take back day that Dr. Kenahan mentioned happens twice a year. Our next one is coming up the third Saturday in October. So um, keep that in mind and, and ICOA will be putting out more information. So with that said, we'll officially close out the formal part of our medications discussion and move on to the physical activity factors 
that impact falls. And again, I just have to start by saying, wow, such a huge topic. Um, Caitlin Gaines and I just met not too long ago. Um, I was beginning uh, a Falls Prevention Coalition for Idaho and the national representative for that program uh, contacted me and said, hey, Caitlin Gaines is looking to do that too. So we're now working together so that um, we can get that underway as I mentioned before. But she has uh, her doctorate in physical therapy, in case you're not sure what a DPT is, that's what it, what it stands for. She works uh, in the acute clinical setting currently in Kootenai Health up in North Idaho. So without further ado again, let me introduce you to Caitlin Gaines and talking about physical um, activity and falls. Thank you, Erin. Can you guys hear me okay? A little soft, but not bad. Okay, sometimes my computer can give me some grief, so please stop me if you cannot hear me. Um, so good morning. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and I'm a physical therapist working in a hospital-based setting in Coeur d'Alene, like Erin said. Um, unfortunately, I'm the one that has a good portion of my patients in the hospital because they've fallen. Okay, so unfortunately, I see the ramifications of falls and how detrimental they can be. Okay, um, so next slide, please. So I'm not going to reiterate all the facts about falls um, that everybody already mentioned, but the biggest one is again is uh, if your fall is reduced by 2030. That is an absolutely alarming number. Um, and there's things that we can do to prevent it. Next slide. Excuse me, Caitlin, you are fading in and out. We're hearing about half of every sentence. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, so what's really important to remember? So falling is not a normal part of aging. So I'm just reiterating what Erin said in the beginning. So staying physically active can significantly reduce your risk of falls. So you can work to improve your strength and balance to help you diminish fall risk. Next slide, please. Next slide. So we all talk about strength, right? So why, why are your muscles important? Why is strength important? So the data indicates that muscular weakness, especially in the lower extremities or legs, is a risk factor for falling in older adults. Weakness is a modifiable risk factor, meaning you can change it, okay? We can always change um, the ability of our muscles to get stronger as we age, okay? It's kind of like the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. Next slide, please. So why is balance important? Okay, so balance allows you to adapt to different surfaces and react to changes in your environment. So as we age, balance can decline and staying active can continue to challenge your balance. So I always kind of like to use an example of someone's walking on a, side, on a sidewalk and there's an unexpected dip in the sidewalk, okay? So if you think of a 20 year old adult walking on the sidewalk, they can react. They can change the way their ankles and their hips and their knees are moving to prevent them from tripping. But as we age, sometimes those sensory systems can diminish. And so what we can do is we can challenge those balance systems, okay? Next slide, please. So why is it so important? Okay, so to go back to the data, exercise is shown to reduce incidence of falls by 13 to 40%. That is a huge number that we can make a really big difference on. So physical therapists and community instructors can assist with individualized exercise programs. Okay, um, something that I wanna make known that I see sometimes and I actually hear from my patients is, if they have a fall, they've developed this um, huge fear of falling and they actually stop going out and doing things because they're so scared of falling. So what that is, is when people restrict activity, they're gonna increase their risk of falling because they're not doing anything, okay? So something to really be aware of is that 
when we have this fear of falling can actually put us at more risk for falling. Next slide, please. So I have several exercises and I'm actually not gonna go through them right now. I think it's best if you guys take a peek at all of these exercises in the resource guide. Erin, are you okay with that? Just because there's so many. Oh yeah, maybe you could just talk briefly about kind of, are there certain muscle groups we should wish we should work on? Sure, yeah. So um, in the data, right? So lower extremity weakness is, is correlated with fall risk, okay? So in these exercises, and um, you can kind of just go through these exercises. You can do the next slide whenever you feel like you wanna do that. But there's a lot of exercises like your quad, your quads and your glutes and um, your ankles that will all help stability um, to decrease your risk of falling, okay? So um, in all these exercises, there's balance exercises and there's also strength exercises. Some of them are standing and some of them are laying down. Um, I wanna make something uh, clear that a lot of people think that they have to go to a gym and have all these exercise pieces of equipment to do all the exercises they need but I just want to make sure that people know that you don't need a gym to increase your strength okay there's so many body weight exercises that you can have at home um, that can have the same effect okay um, one thing I want to share is that gravity can be your friend okay so sometimes I would encourage people to stand up from a lower surface, or don't use your arms to help you to stand up from a surface, things like that that are gonna challenge you. And those are just kind of things you can do at home. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Oh, actually, let's stick here. Um, so what you can do at home, strengthen the lower body, stretch your arms, your legs, your back, your shoulders, work to improve your balance, do things that you enjoy, okay? Um, everybody thinks they have to, you know, sometimes an exercise program can feel like a burden because they don't like it. Well, talk to your therapist or talk to your in instructors and figure out something that you like um, that can help you guide your own exercises, okay? And then being active with others. It's always fun to interact with others, talk about challenges, talk about successes. It can essentially make you more successful in this journey. Next slide, please. So thank you, Caitlin. And um, this is one of your slides as well that you included lots and lots of resources. I just wanted to remind everybody that our resource guide, which will be finished in a few days when we get our last seminar done, has all of the extra resources and sometimes the things that our panelists referred to during their presentation. So all of those exercise slides that uh, Caitlin was showing are gonna be in there so you can actually see them and go through them and work through them at home. Uh, she said something that was you know, really hit home for me, which is I was fairly proud to say, you know, I didn't have to change my clothing size or anything like that during the pandemic. So I was doing pretty good. Then I went in for a medical appointment and had uh, just what they call the stand test. You sit in a firm chair and how many times can you stand up and down, like Caitlin said, without using your arms within a minute? Well, I am not considered a senior yet. I'm 55 years old. Um, I do have some chronic conditions, but still I was in kind of the middle category for somebody who was 60. And it was like, oh my gosh, before the pandemic, I was working out and lifting weights and I did not realize how much strength I had lost in my lower body. So, um, you know, that is, is like she said, the number one, one way that we can prevent and recover falls simply by having muscles that are able to react quickly enough and with enough strength to uh, stop our body. That good old a body in motion wants to stay in motion. Well, we want to stop that motion <laughs> before it becomes a fall. So next slide, please. And thank you, Caitlin. So I get to talk to you now for just a, a few minutes about food, water, and falls. Uh, it again is something that 
we go, yeah, 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 we know um, we're supposed to, you know, eat and drink well and all that stuff that we've been hearing since we were kids. Uh, a lot of seniors, though, tend to have poor nutrition. And most of us, believe it or not, even who are younger people, um, are dehydrated to a point, not significantly, but enough that it's, it's not cool. So next slide, please. Um, you know, nutrition is always important. You can't have a, an engine and a car that works good if you don't have good fuel in it. We all, all know that. But loss of muscle mass and strength, uh, you know, leads to these problems that we've been talking about, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, malnutrition actually greatly impacts your body. Your body uh, can't keep itself strong and actually degrades if we don't provide the proper nutrition. There's growing evidence that um, older people are undernourished, are food insecure. Unfortunately, with some of the issues we have going on today, that has gotten even bigger. So older adults um, have those challenges. And in some ways, you know, we say there are no symptoms of just because I'm getting older. But one of the things, again, that we see is that older adults become weaker with age. We don't want that to happen. So eat healthy and exercise. That's not new news, right? <laughs> but let's go to our next slide and talk a little bit about something else. So as we said, dehydration can lead to falls in older adults and everybody. Complications from dehydration, um, you know, it can make you dizzy. It can cause a drop in blood pressure. Um, it can just make you generally weaker than you would be if you were fully hydrated. You also may not be aware of how much water you need to drink. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because people just don't know how much water they should be drinking each day. But the other is that as we age, some of the receptors in our mouth and our throat uh, and the things that happen in our brain kind of short circuit or don't work as well. So we don't know when we should be thirsty. That can be the problem because by the time an older person feels thirsty, they're probably beyond when they are. Um, we want to you know, make sure that we can, um, we can reduce dehydration by simply drinking water. Now we have to know that drinking soda and coffee doesn't help because some of them are actually diuretics and they, they don't do what we want. So good old water is, is a, a really good idea. How do we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways that we can. One way is just to keep water with you at all times. What I actually love, and I just learned about this, so oh, I don't know, last year, I guess, are called smart water bottles. First, there are some that just come with measurements so you can see how much you have had in a day. Some of them, the measurement are the hours. So they assume that you know you work eight to five. So there's a mark for 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m. and your water level should be at that point. I kind of like the ones that uh, are a little bit of electronic. They have lights and they sense if you haven't had a drink in an hour, it'll light up and flash at you. And that's good for me because I just plain old forget. I have water sitting near me. I just don't bother to drink it. So some of these things can help us remember to, to drink. It is important though to kind of keep track, uh, whatever method that may be so that you can make sure you're getting enough water every day. Um, we know that uh, Dr. Kinahan talked about how medications impact falls risk. Another way that that happens is that some medical conditions can cause us to either retain or loss of water. Many of us have heard of edema. I have swollen ankles, that's extra fluid. But again, medications um, can, can play uh, an important part in, in our hydration as well. Next slide, please. So we're just coming off of summer. And if you remember not that long ago, like uh, last week for many of us in Idaho, 
it was over 100 degrees. And at that point, we had people on TV and radio and other places reminding us it's hot, there's a hot weather alert, uh, you know, stay inside, do those kinds of things. Some of them talked about needing to increase our fluid intake, some of them did not. Um, that, of course, is part of being in any kind of warm weather condition is increasing your fluid intake. Um, when we, we think about dehydration, we get certain signs. And again, once you get the signs and symptoms, you know, you're kind of already in the, the process, which is a little later than we want to be. But uh, as we said, older adults may not feel like they're thirsty, but all of us might start to feel fatigued. There might be confusion. You might feel lightheaded or dizzy. Uh, definitely can feel unsteady, which we can see how all of these, including being dizzy uh, and of course fainting are parts of, of falling. If somebody has pale, cold, clammy skin, a lot of times you'll hear people say they have stopped sweating in a hot environment because their body is just out of water. Another one is um, less urination. You don't have to go to the bathroom, or when you do, it's a very, very dark yellow. If you ever go to Death Valley, all of the restrooms have charts uh, in, in front of every facility that tells you to look at the color of your urine to see if you're uh, you're dehydrated. We also can get dim or blurred vision. We can see how that can impact falling. If I can't see clearly, that would be a bad thing. Um, so these are the signs and symptoms. Know what they are, maybe even keep a list if you're gonna be outside and you don't wanna have to remember them all, uh, but be aware of them and just prevent ever getting to this point. I'm going to go very quickly through the next uh, slide or two just to uh, to get through what we need to. But alcohol um, is is also something to be aware of with falls. Um, I think we can can figure out why. Um, if you are impaired by alcohol or any substance, then you are not able to react or respond as quickly. Um, you can get blurred vision if you have a high alcohol uh, content in your blood. Some of the things we've heard about for years. So this is not a discussion of alcohol, good or bad. It's a simple talking point that alcohol uh, can impact your ability to um, prevent a fall. It can cause falls, so to speak, that we may not have had before for a variety of reasons. Next slide, please. So we've kind of been over some of the what you can do for each of these sections. And that's really what we're here about. We want you to know uh, the, the background behind falls, but most importantly, the second half of our seminar title is and how to prevent them. So when we talk about um, you know, the things we've just mentioned the last couple of sections, we know that we want to eat nutritious food. We want to eat at regular intervals. We want to drink the appropriate amount of water or fluids. We want to know the signs of dehydration. And we can discuss how medications uh, might impact us with our pharmacist or our physician. And of course, if you're going to consume alcohol, do so in moderation. That's always the best uh, advice. Next slide, please. This is just another way to reiterate what we've been saying. A few simple steps can go a long way to reducing your risk of falls. A couple of things that we have not mentioned in this seminar, but we have in the others, is that you might want to do a, um, an audit in your home for trip hazards, because most of them can be simply and either free or cheaply resolved. And since a majority of our injuries, over half, happen in the home, that's probably a good place to start. Make it safe for yourself, for your visitors, for your guests, anybody else that, uh, that you may come into contact with. Next slide, please. So we've talked a lot all through today 
about your falls risk. And you might say, okay, I now understand what that is, but how do I know what mine is? When you visit with your healthcare professional, you can ask to have a falls risk assessment. Uh, you should probably do that when you're making your appointment so they know to be ready for it, but that is something that, that they can do. A physical therapist can also provide an extensive uh, falls evaluation, but you can also start by going to the National Council on Aging uh, onto their website and use an online tool. It asks a dozen yes, no questions. That's all you have to do is say yes or no, and you submit it and you instantly know what your falls risk is. If you provide your email address, they will email you the results along with a bunch of resources that you can use, again, to uh, help reduce your falls. And you also can take that report and share it with your healthcare provider. Next slide, please. Now the time has come that I know all of our panelists wait for uh, eagerly. And actually that's true because uh, all of them are about education. And so they're all about answering questions. At this point, I am going to let our Zoom be, that's the term I think I came up with. It's unique as far as I know. Uh, we have Barbara who's been running our slideshow and now we're gonna have Chris who's been monitoring the Q&A. Chris, can you give us some questions that may have come in? So far, the only question that has been posed is, isn't there a state pilot uh, or isn't the state piloting a medical safe box program for free? This was back in our medication security section. And um, I would like to open that up to the panelists. Well, I can start by saying that the Commission on Aging is working with the Office of Drug Policy to offer uh, free drug safes through our programs, for example, if you're part of our caregiver uh, support groups, that's one of the places. I will let some of our panelists address a statewide uh, effort or any efforts that they know of that, that uh, may be available. Dr. Kinahan, are you aware of any of those programs? You know, I'm sorry to say that I'm not. Um, I'm somewhat insular at the VA. Um, I know there are a lot of take back programs at the VA, but I am not aware of any statewide programs. Doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means that my sure, awareness sure, sure. level is <laughs> not great. <laughs> Dr. Bates, are you still with us? Yes, yes, and I, I apologize. Can I have that question read again? I just wanna make sure I'm addressing the right answer. Someone basically wanted to know if the state was currently working on a uh, drug safe program where people could get medication boxes. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that specifically from a state perspective, but uh, I know individual pharmacies are willing to help with that. Um, you know, if, if families in support or caregivers of that uh, patient may approach their uh, private pharmacists, they might be able to uh, get further help with that. I know there's also bubble packing of medications that can occur with, with individual pharmacies that can help, um, that can really help with medication safety. Sure, medication safety and medication management is a huge topic. And uh, I'm thinking we might need to do a seminar on that in a couple of months. I will put that together. What I will do though, is do a little more research specifically for any programs the state of Idaho has. And I will send that out to all of you as well as putting, um, putting the answer onto that falls webpage. So keep an, keep an eye out for that. I think we had another question, Chris. Yes. How do you handle an older adult that chooses to pick and choose when they take certain medications, diuretics, et cetera, and with how often they hydrate themselves due to fear of incontinence when out of their home. That was presented to us from Mike. Yeah. Fantastic question. <laughs> um, so this is Dr. Kinahan, I can answer that one. Um, that's a very common uh, problem that we see. 
Um, and I don't know that there's one right answer. I think that um, what I would do is kind of tailor the response to um, what they're currently doing and try to make it fit with their lifestyle and their needs. Um, Cause I totally get it that fear of incontinence can be really life limiting, um, but not taking their diuretics can also um, be a big problem too. So um, it's a balancing act, which I know is maybe not the best answer, um, but usually uh, there are non-pharmacologic steps that can help out with the incontinence like timed voids. Um, so that means urinating on a schedule um, and that can help with some bladder retraining and some bladder confidence. Um, and if the diuretic can't be avoided, than timing uh, when to take it around what works best with their schedule is probably what I would recommend. Excellent answer to a very complicated question because it is absolutely individualized. Um, I do want to do a little shout out and promotion for both Chris and Barbara uh, who work up in North Idaho. Our North Idaho Area Agency on Aging has been providing the Mind Over Matter continence uh, workshop for going on two years now. Um, and as far as we know, it is the only non-medical training that somebody can come to. So if you're interested in that, let us know because uh, we would love to have, uh, uh, have you attend to learn some of those things that Dr. Kenahan was mentioning. Um, I know that uh, that really is the conundrum I have to drink in order to stay hydrated, but when I stay hydrated, then I have to go to the bathroom and, and bathroom runs, especially in the middle of the night, are a leading cause of falls. And of course, we are all concerned about that. So, so that question really does um, bring into play many of the things that we talked about today. And hopefully we can also provide some solutions uh, through the, the Mind Over Matter or Mom workshop as well. I think we have another question, Chris. Well, actually, Mike just uh, typed a thank you for, uh, oh. I, I, I told him his great on his question. But Aaron, I do have uh, the, the answer to the, the first question we had about lock boxes. Um, I did a quick search and there is a resource. It's called Vaults. It's online. You can, they've actually partnered with lockyourmeds.org. Um, they, they have a, if you're willing to spend, you know, 25 or $30, you, you can share that resource. It's straight up amazon.com. I won't plug mm -hmm. them outside this venue, but right. if, if you do an online search, they are uh, available and affordable. Also, um, we, we were provided uh, through a local grant at our Panhandle Health, uh, a few of the lock boxes. Mm -hmm. So if you're in our area, come by the office and we'll uh, we'll show you what we've got. Get you set up. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we've heard from Office of Drug Policy is they also had a grant. You know, they can't afford to give everybody in the state one, but if you contact us, we will make sure you get one. That did also though remind me of uh, the other half of Mike's question, which was what do we do about people who may not be compliant with their medication regimen? Some of the, uh, the, the uh, items that are available for drug management and safety include, for example, a pill vial that looks pretty much like your normal pill vial, but you put your yeah, pills into it, and it actually can tell you the last date and time it was opened. Now, that's designed to find out if somebody's you know, taken your meds, but it also can be used for people who may have uh, you know, memory issues to, to know when was the last time I opened this. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're taking the right dose when it was opened, but there are some uh, medication management tools um, that, that can be helpful, including some of the items that we're talking about here. So I had a quick question. Um, about AFib. It seems like everybody I know these days is now diagnosed with AFib. And because of that, they are also taking a blood thinner. There are you know, two or three main ones. Okay. My question okay. is, you know, if somebody is on a blood thinner, um, what should they 
do and or look for if they fall because of the blood thinner? And that's probably a Dr. Kinahan question. Well, we're thinking that we might need it. Yeah, um, I think the big thing with patients falling on blood thinners that we worry about is head injuries, just like Dr. Bates was talking about. Um, so if someone's hit their head and they're on a blood thinner, then um, they need to go to the emergency room. Um, so even if they are feeling fine, they don't have a headache, they haven't lost consciousness, if they've hit their head, um, good to be checked out at the emergency room. Um, people on blood thinners are also more likely to bruise more easily. So just being aware that um, minor bumps and bruises, even in the absence of a head injury, you're going to see some scary looking bruising. That's usually nothing to worry about. Um, but the big thing is if you hit your head. Um, I think there's pretty good awareness now, but when I was in training, um, people would come in after a fall and the first thing that um, doctors would want to do is stop their blood thinner and say you can't be on a blood thinner now because you've fallen. Um, that's pretty much gone by the wayside because the understanding now is that the risk of stroke um, still outweighs the risk of injury or, um, uh, or any other bad outcome related to a fall unless um, I think the data is unless you're falling 300 times per year. Um, so I, I do see patients who fall every day, right? Um, so that's not totally outside the realm of possibility. But if someone's falling, you know, once a month or once or twice a year, it's totally reasonable for them to be on a blood thinner. Um, so that's the other plug I would make is if you're on a blood thinner for AFib and you've had one or two isolated falls and someone tries to say you need to stop your blood thinner, um, really having a detailed conversation about the risks and benefits at that point, because um, most of the time, the risk of stroke uh, will outweigh the risk of any bleeding related to a fall. That makes perfect sense. I know, again, balancing act keeps coming up. You know, how do I deal with one thing versus another thing and which is more important? Um, I, I do want to also just say that anybody on a blood thinner, please be sure that when you go in for, oh, I don't know, let's say a blood draw, <laughs> that you tell the person you're on a blood thinner. I do know somebody who did not do that. And next thing you know, um, trying to get out of the, the clinic, blood's running down the arm. And it's like, well, did you tell them that you had a blood thinner? Well, no. Okay, they probably would have done, you know, a little more pressure, <laughs> something like that. So don't be afraid to divulge uh, those kinds of things either to prevent that kind of stuff. So I think we have time for one more question. And I'm going to ask that of uh, Caitlin. Caitlin, if I have fatigue or not a lot of energy or not a lot of time or whatever the case may be, um, you know, kind of how often do I need to do some of these exercises that you've talked about? And how do I know how many to do? Sure, yeah. So time is very valuable, right, to anybody. <laughs> uh, so to set, set, set time aside to exercise can sometimes feel like a burden. Um, so to answer your first question, how often, so with the exercises that are going to be provided today, you know, two to three times is completely adequate per day, um, to do those exercises anywhere from five to 10 repetitions is great. Um, I want to emphasize, um, that when you're doing them, if you're having pain, um, a lot of people think no pain, no gain. Um, but that's not true. Okay. So your body is trying to tell you something. So if any of these exercises are painful, make sure you stop. Okay. Um, if you do the exercises one day, a couple times a day, and you're really fatigued the next day, then don't, then don't do them that day and maybe kind of decrease the frequency. Okay. So you don't want to tucker yourself out where you can't function the next day, but you want to do enough that you're actually gaining muscle. You know, it sounds a lot like our, our I think we're going to call it our saying for the day, which is balance, <laughs> yeah, just exactly. enough so that I can do some good, but not too enough that uh, not too much that I'm hurting myself or, or being counterproductive. Excellent, excellent advice. Well, as we are coming to the close, uh, I would like to go to our next slide.
and be sure that we thank all of our uh, people that were involved today. And believe it or not, that does include all of you in the audience, our participants. Without you, we're kind of talking to ourselves. And I think uh, people who do podcasts and TV shows kind of got tired of talking to themselves after two years. So we are just thrilled to be able to have you, uh, you with us. Uh, it does add the energy, it adds the questions, and of course, that's what we're here for, is to get the information out. Next, of course, are our panelists, uh, our experts for the day. Uh, it actually takes quite a bit of time to get ready for these kinds of seminars, so we want to thank all of them for taking their valuable time to you know, do the slides and come up with the information, and, uh, and then, of course, to be here today. So thank you uh, as well. And then I need to give a personal thank you to our Zoombies today, Chris and Barbara, because I've done this stuff on my own and it doesn't work well. <laughs> so we want to thank them for, for handling the slides and, and the Q&A and, and all of those other things that happened. Next slide, please. With that, I'm going to say uh, thank you to everybody. Remember that Falls are not a part of aging. We can do simple things to reduce or prevent them. You simply need to find out what your risk factors are and then uh, take some simple steps to make that happen so you don't become a statistic. We want a, a good statistic. Remember that uh, I work with Idaho Commission on Aging. We have six area agencies on aging or AAAs across the state. They're located in all six regions. If you ever need any information, assistance, or referral about aging issues, uh, nutrition programs, transportation, chore, homemaker, uh, caregivers, uh, our workshops that we have on diabetes self-management, powerful tools for caregivers, chronic pain self-management, all of that wonderful information can be gathered from your local AAA, and you can reach them by phone or by email and also the information on our website, aging.idaho.gov. So with that, thanks to everybody so much. It was fantastic, lots of good information, and we hope you all have a falls-free rest of your day. Thank you for joining us. This has been a production brought to you by the Idaho Commission on Aging, supporting well-being for aging Idahoans since 1968. For more information on resources to stay at home, stay healthy, stay safe, and to stay informed, visit our website at www.aging.idaho.gov.